myself and, and thank you for the uh, invitation to speak uh, on exosomes today. My name is Brian Darzinski. Uh, I'm from the United States and uh, I'm a stem cell scientist. I've been in the field uh, for 17 years. Uh, I started out with a heart stem cell company that had a lab in Israel and we did uh, clinical trials here in Thailand for congestive heart failure and um, angina. We did direct injections into the heart as well as we did uh, catheter procedure uh, up the femoral artery to deliver through balloon angio. So that was, uh, we did one trial with 26 patients, another trial with 124 patients, and then we received FDA approval in Thailand uh, to move forward and treat well over 600 patients. So we were the first company to do commercial use at, uh, autologous stem cells in the world. Um, I moved on uh, from that company to another company uh, doing adipose sterilized stem cells. Uh, there we did, um, Three clinical trials, uh, one on um, type 2 diabetes, where we did intravenous infusion of the stromal vascular fraction uh, that was in the Philippines, and then we did um, a clinical trial here in Thailand for stem cell enriched fat uh, for women that had uh, defects in their breast post lumpectomy. So we used the fat to fill the lumps and uh, to uh, regrow the tissue. We did that with uh, Jules Longhorn University, and then we did two clinical trials in Europe for idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, where we did intravenous application of the cells, and then we used uh, Technesium-99 uh, to tag the radioactive isotope, to tag the stem cells, and then scan the body one day later um, to prove to the physician that the stem cells were in the lungs. Uh, we also used Indium-111, which is a, a color fluorescent uh, tag, uh, and we proved that the stem cells passed the blood brain barrier and went up to, to the infarct. Uh, we did some uh, patients that had brain injury, and again, we were the first group in the world to prove that we could, that stem cells actually go with where the physicians want them to go. And then uh, I finished up uh, that work, and I uh, got involved with some uh, biomedicine with um, an Infinity product, which is a NAP product. I did a clinical trial at the University of Helsinki, which we just completed. So my background, I'm a, I'm a stem cell uh, scientist, and you know what, what's really interesting and what we're gonna talk to you about is um, what's called fresh frozen exosomes. And uh, they are the communicating molecules uh, that stem cells utilize um, to talk to each other. So for me, this is a natural um, evolution. Uh, we're really excited about this. It's a, um, probably gonna be the, the real breakthrough product for regenerative medicine for a couple of reasons. Um, primarily because it's something that you can store in your clinic in the freezer, take out, and then use for the patient uh, immediately, which makes it, um, you know, kind of like an off-the-shelf product. So today we're gonna to go through some uh, stuff for our skin product, which is called Exo15, Exo and the product's called Revive, and there's two, uh, two uh, basically solutions that we have. Exo15 is 15 million cells, and Exo25 is 25 billion exosomes. And, uh, and just, just to give you a quick uh, background, um, so our company has been in business for 17 years, complying um, different types of stem cells and regenerative medicine around the world. We had a, a very big seminar last uh, Monday. We had over 300 doctors attend um, this uh, launch of our Revive Exosome product. It took about, we did four hours, um, and we had you know, different speakers that came in from a scientific standpoint and a clinical standpoint. And uh, we looked at five different competitors, um, primarily powder products that were from Korea, and we explained in, in very, very, uh, exquisite detail, um, how we look at exosomes, how we measure the quality of the exosomes, what the cargo is inside the exosomes, what the particle size is, and the concentrations that are in the vials. 
and it was kind of shocking, and the doctors were, were very shocked with what, what we presented scientifically. I'm going to do this in a four hour presentation in about 20 minutes, and then we have, um, you know, through, through Sazu, we can um, get you guys, if you want to get more detail, we can do presentations on, um, you know, different aspects of characterizing exosomes. So you guys can see my screen okay? Yes, 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 can, yes. Can the camera. Can we put the, the screen on the, on the large screen? Thank you. We are so honored to have you with us. Uh, I've seen some of the hints of the, of the results when, I've, when I was uh, in Bangkok. That's why I think it's really interesting and really crucial for us to see it. Because you have so many companies uh, misleading doctors with what they have in their vial. And you're the only company that I know that done really extensive research on that. So we're really grateful to have you here and we're looking forward to, to seeing your presentation. Thank you so much. Okay, thanks for that. And, and that's, the, that's the background of the company. We consider ourselves the due diligence arm for private clinics and physicians. Doctors don't have time to do this. Um, what we do is we buy all of the different products, our doctors help us, we give them, you know, we pay them, they give us the products, and then we run them through our lab, and we give them, you know, readouts of what's actually happening, what's in these products, and, you know, we find, you know, there's a lot of opportunities, um, because some of the products are just so poor quality, that if we just produce, you know, a good clinical great quality, the doctors love it, the patients come back, you know, recurring revenue, and you know, and that's that's kind of been our philosophy is we want to doctors to look at us and say, okay, have you guys taken a look at, at, at the market and what do you guys see? So I'll I'll start uh, going through my deck here. Um, uh, Jimmy, you are right. Uh, it's not the slides are pretty part. Um, we're resting. It's available. They can send it on the slide. And the connection was through the Okay. So this is uh, so today we're going to be talking about the uh, red body, which is primarily for uh, skin rejuvenation. And uh, as we age, um, what happens is uh, we get cellular senescence uh, comes into play, and of course the uh, the quality of the skin, the production of collagen and elastin goes down. There's DNA damage and cellular dysfunction. So the goal is to kind of reverse these activities. So the senescence was first kind of discovered in 1965 um, by, by Dr. Hayflick, uh, and he was talking about how cells can only replicate a certain number of times, and then they basically wear out. They don't they don't perform the function that they did in the past, and they're basically um, you know they, they become senescent or zombie cells. Those cells, of course, can turn into cancerous cells. So. There's some of the uh, consequences to this are the degradation of the extracellular matrix, which for skin applications, you're gonna give you wrinkles, um, you know, you're gonna, your skin is gonna look um, you know, old, basically. We'll get atrophy, uh, we'll get age-related pigmentation, that's a very, very big concern. And I'll show you some clinical results of how quickly we can deal with that age-related pigmentation. And that really helps the doctors gain the confidence of uh, the patients, because the patients can clearly see these spots go away. So uh, wound healing um, is another way that we prove that the physician to do what's called a wound healing assay, a fibroblast assay, where we take some fibroblasts, we take, make a little mark down the center of it, um, and then we put a drop of a product in between, and then we see how fast the fibroblasts close up the wound. This is the gold standard for skin care uh, and for regenerative medicine as well. And then um, we'll talk a little bit about inflammatory cytokines. Um, I have a whole basically a PowerPoint on how our exosomes bring down the inflammatory response after we inject them. I can go through the interleukins with you in a very, very uh, detailed uh, overview. So you can see that's one of the things that you want from an exosome product is you want an anti-inflammatory response with the patient. You can do the injections and then go back to work the same day. Other products you may take you know, five, six, seven days for the patient to recover. So again, what we're trying to look at is um, each skin, the pigmentation, uh, there's sagging, uh, you know, delayed wound healing happens, loss of elasticity, skin cancer obviously is one for older people, skin becomes sensitive, and then you get fine and coarse wrinkles. So this is what we're trying to address with this particular, and I'll call it our recipe of exosomes. So this one is for skin regeneration. Um, we're also going to have recipes for called neural regeneration. We'll have it for um, uh, orthopedic applications. 
So these exosomes, we can actually tell the cells, the stem cells, what type of exosome to make. And this is a huge difference between us and, and competitive products. They have no intentions of doing this. We are going to do uh, aesthetic applications, and then we're also going to do medical applications uh, for our exosome products directed at clinical indications. So this is um, just an, a quick overview. Uh, I could do uh, an hour on this one slide alone, but I'll just go through quickly. Extracellular vesicles is the, is the broad category term. Uh, exosomes fit under that extracellular vesicle category. Uh, they contain RNA, um, mRNA, and miRNA. There's signaling proteins, growth factors, immunomodulatory, uh, like cytokines, as I mentioned. There's cryoprotective molecules. So when you start using this product, you'll inject it in the face, and you'll see that glow that, that many women and you know, men also want to see after they get the treatment. And what's happening is the exosomes are creating a protective barrier around the cells. And that leaves the face hydrated, basically, and you get this little glow. And that's really what you know, patients will come back, will take pictures, and send to their friends and family. There's also functional proteins that are inside uh, the exosomes, um, and there's uh, receptors that are on the outside of the exosomes that also trigger uh, cellular regeneration. So some of the functions, uh, again, skin rejuvenation, wound healing, anti-inflammation, and prevention of skin cancer. These are things that we're looking at. Um, we want to exit the senescent state, so we want the cell to either kill itself or we want the cell to come back to life, but not stay in the middle. Uh, we want an angiogenic abilities. We want their new blood vessel formation. I can go into that in more detail. Uh, we want fibroblasts to get activated and come to the surface of the skin. And this, this is a really important um, signaling uh, capability of the exosomes that we produce. They allow the fibroblasts to move, migrate, and then when they migrate, the fibroblasts release things like elastin and collagen into the area and regenerate the skin. So there's, uh, again, pigment regulation, pigmentation, you'll see in a couple of slides uh, in, the, in the case series that, you know, this clearly moves uh, pigmentation as we age. And there's also more protection and regeneration. And again, this, this we won't go into that in detail in this presentation, but that's another thing we see. So for wound healing, there's the angiogenic ability, there's the dermal fibroblast activation. Again, I'll show you some of the research that we did. We took the, all the competitors' products, the ones from Korea primarily, a couple from America, um, and we put them in these uh, fibroblast wound healing assays and we measured how fast did the wound close. And, and surprisingly, uh, most of them actually had little to any effect uh, over control. And then, um, so regulation of inflammation. So again, if you, if you work with these, these uh, products, a lot of them um, will have preservatives that they use um, to keep the bacteria from growing. Ours, we have absolutely no preservatives. It comes to you in a frozen vial without preservatives, so you don't have to worry about any types of reactions. You, what you want is an anti-inflammatory effect when you inject this into the, into the face, which is what we're, we're talking about today. And, and you don't want the immune cells to be activated. If they become activated, then you have problems. The patient has red marks. They may get hematomas. And they're going to certainly complain and not be happy with the downside. So our product is designed to be an anti-inflammatory uh, uh, treatment. So again, prevention of skin cancer. So we're going to exit the senescent state. So we want, this, we want the cells that are being communicated with to either do one of two things, either kill themselves or get out of the senescent state. And this, we can go into this in a little more detail. Cryoprotection, this is uh, one uh, amazing result from using this, is that you'll be able to see in a matter of days that these the patients' skin will start to glow. And this is what primarily the women want to see when they get treatment. They want to see that glow. Their friends and family uh, you know, will, will comment. And again, this is going to keep uh, you know, your patients uh, telling other people to keep your practice busy. So this is again, we have two, two products, 15 billion particles, XO15 and XO25. And what I what, what, what is exciting about this for me is that um, if you use a high quality mesenchyme stem cell, you will get high quality exosomes. And you know, for 17 years, I've known that you have to use low passage uh, cells to get clinical effects. It's just no, there's no passage one is the best, two and three are, are, are very good. Um, so we do uh, laboratory tests on our exosomes after our high quality stem cells produce them. So we're going to look at the, the two things that we're going to really focus on is concentration, how many exosomes are in that bottle. And you know, the title of our, our event last Monday with 300 doctors was 
do you know what you're buying? And the whole event was about showing all the different competitors and what was in their in their vials. We look at the size and the concentration, I'll go into why that's important. We also look at CD markers, so just like stem cells have surface markers, excellent surface markers that you need to kind of learn a little bit about, there's only three. Uh, we look at the growth factors, that's the cargo inside the exosome, um, which is really, really important. Um, some of the uh, products that we looked at actually had nothing in them. Uh, one product in particular, ASCE, from Korea, had zero growth factors, but it did have epidermal growth factor, which was, which was really unusual in very high concentrations. And what, we're, uh, what, we're believe, what we believe is that they're actually just spiking their powdered uh, uh, lipolyzed product with uh, epidermal growth factor that you can buy for you know, $3 uh, a vial. So, um, and then we also looked at the fibroblast activation, do these fibroblasts activate the meat? And then finally, ours is what's called a fresh frozen liquid. So it is more difficult to deal with, but if you think about stem cells, the best ones are the ones that you know come to your clinic that are you know have just been thawed from the freezer and activated. Same thing with the exosome product. Um, we believe at this point that a fresh frozen exosome is going to outperform any lipolyzed product on the market. And I'll go through a little bit of the competitors, and you'll see the only one that that really had any uh, really close comparison was one from the United States, which was fresh frozen, and the cost was you know, five times what we're charging for our product. So again, early passage uh, stem cells uh, have a good morphology. So this is where exosomes come from. There's actually a company out of Korea uh, that is making uh, an exosome product and they're using plant, plant-based uh, uh, production. Basically they're using, from what we can figure out, uh, some sort of rose uh, plant to produce this lipolyzed product. So it's not even of human origin. It's very concerning. But anyway, we're here to share this data with you. you know, we're, we're doing this um, to kind of help you know, move the, the medical industry uh, in the right direction. So this is an example of a passage one stem cell. It's a very nice morphology. You can see that you know, it's a, they're not crowded together. And this is what we've been doing um, at the lab for 15 years, running stem cell therapies to patients so we understand how to produce a clinical grade stem cell. The people in, you know, that are just getting into the market, these Korean companies, they never ever treated a stem cell patient. They never produced a stem cell line in their lives. And you know, they, they just are you know, getting in this to, to you know, because it's a hot market, I understand that. But um, you have to show that you can produce something that benefits the physicians. So this is um, how we do the manufacturing and how we test uh, the stem cells. So again, uh, CD marker, CD105, CD73, and CD90, they're the three primary markers uh, to designate mesenchyme stem cells. So we have this you know, very well uh, characterized. Our team's been doing this for you know, over 15 years. So we can produce a fantastic stem cell. So in order to prove to the doctors that the stem cell that we produce is, is um, what it's supposed to be, it has to be able to go down three different lineages, so osteocytes, adipocytes, and chondrocytes. So we have to push the stem cell down into those lineages. If you can do that, then that proves clinically that this stem cell is, is functioning and it's going to do what, what uh, a doctor expects it to do in uh, their clinic. So this is just kind of an overview. We look at the CD markers to identify and make sure you have a pure stem cell uh, line to make these exosomes. We look make, that they can differentiate into these different, three different uh, subsets of cells. And then also we look at what's called the secretome. Secretome is what the stem cells release. So there's 450 different types of um, bioactive uh, compounds that come off of a mesenchyme stem cell. Um, one of them is an exosome. Um, so it's very, uh, you know, we're very comfortable for, for us. You can see, if you can see EGF is one of the ones that everyone looks at. You can see on the secretome. Again, that's where we saw a competitor is actually dosing uh, their powder with this uh, one very inexpensive uh, epidermal growth factor and, and saying that it's, it's an exosome. Um, and then of course T-cell suppression. So stem cells, just like the exosomes that we produce, are anti-inflammatory. Um, they should bring down the inflammatory process so that you don't have to deal with patients that are you know, upset or have hematomas. So this uh, section is called size and concentration. So size does matter. Stem cells for them to get to the blood-brain barrier in, in three to five microns in size, as you grow them, passage two, three, four, five, they get up to about 40 or 50 microns. They're never ever going to pass the blood-brain barrier. 
When you give them an IV into the arm, they're going to pump through the heart and they're going to get stuck in the lungs. It's called the pulmonary pass effect. So the stem cells are just too big. They're fine for lung treatments, um, but if you want to do any other treatments, um, they're never going to go into small uh, blood vessels in the, uh, in the body. So this is uh, what's called a zeta view. Um, you guys are going to you get into the exosome field and you start working with this. We're the only company in Thailand that actually have one of these nanoparticle tracking analysis uh, devices. Um, it's, it's an amazing piece of equipment. It's extraordinarily expensive. Um, but to make a long story short, what it does is it allows us to buy competitors' products and very quickly look at the size and the concentration and are they telling the truth when they're advertising to doctors about what's inside the vials and what, what's the concentration. Are you buying 100 million exosomes or are you buying 15 billion? So I'll get a little more detail. So the right, on the right is red, that's the uh, fluorescent, fluorescent um, stain of the particles so the computer will analyze exactly what's happening as far as the size and the concentration of the exosomes. So here, this is a, a very important graph. Um, this is one that gets generated right from this um, uh, zeta view. Uh, and you can see it's in um, nanometers at the bottom. And you can see the peak is at about 130 nanometers. And then it comes all the way down uh, about 200. And so this is, this is an ideal uh, graph. And you should memorize this graph because this is what you want to see from any, any Texazone product that you buy, the ideal size is about 100 to 130 uh, microns. And we'll go a little more uh, into detail. This is an example of a, of a, of a what they call a blank or, or a, a control. So here's the, um, the printout. It comes out of the machine. You, you cannot edit it. You cannot modify it. Um, and it basically tells you how many particles and what's the size of the concentration. Um, and then this is uh, a, uh, you know, again, we can provide this with every lot. Um, if you start purchasing the products and you want to have a QA, QC, we're more than happy to send this to you. So this is a, a close-up of that graph. So, so high-quality products, meaning high-quality stem cells, will produce high-quality exosomes. So the average size of the one is about 100 to 130 uh, nanometers. And just remember this graph because you can see a bunch of other graphs of the competitors. Uh, some that you're, that you're currently buying, and it's very, very concerning uh, what, what they're selling on, on the market. So again, this is a, uh, you know, what you guys need to remember and then we'll move forward. So the most particle size in the graph are 130 nanometers. Some particles go up to 200, which is fine. Um, and then if you look on the bottom, there are no particles larger than 500, zero. That means we have a, a very homogeneous population, which is exactly what you want. So we move on. Again, high purity, there's no particles. Most particles are in that range of 130 nanometers. So it's a clear exosome EV population. You don't have to worry that there's impurities or there's also what's called apoptotic bodies that are associated with dying cells. Um, and those, those, we have found those in other products. And you know, those, those actually trigger the cancer genes, oncogenes to turn on. So comparison to major competitors. So I'll go into some of this. Um, so these are some of the competitors um, that we looked at. I think the one on the far right, ASCE, is the one that you're probably most familiar with. Um, we've, we've compared, I think, almost nine different ones. Uh, for this presentation, I'm just going to go into the five that we looked at. Um, so here's the, uh, the five competitors with the EV concentrations. So competitor one, two, three, four, and five. And you can see um, uh, three of the five did not have the advertised concentrations of particles. So uh, basically, they told the doctors they were getting 15 billion particles and they were getting 500 million, uh, which is quite concerned. Some of them were up to uh, 1 billion, again, stating they had 15 billion, so literally 1 15th of what they're advertising they're getting. And then even what they were providing in the vials, when we looked at them, had the, the size and the concentration didn't match up with a, with a good solid exosome product. So here's some graphs. So this is competitor one. Uh, you can see very large uh, particle size, very low concentration. Competitor three, enormous particle size, 400, 500 nanometers. Again, those could be apoptotic bodies. Um, competitor two, uh, on the bottom here, again, um, the size was okay, but the, the concentration was, again, about 99 million per ml, which is uh, nowhere near uh, 15 billion per vial. Uh, competitor four, again, you can see the, the massive size of 200, 300, 400, even 500 
nanometer size uh, particles in the vial. So what that means is that, um, again, the, the competitor five up the top, um, you can see that that, that is a very un, unusual uh, graph, meaning that the particle size uh, and, and the concentrations are nowhere near what they're advertising. The bottom right, remember this graph, that's what a good exosome graph should look like. So if you learn one thing uh, from what we, we talk about, that's what a good exosome graph should look like. And that's you should be you know, your suppliers, your distributors, um, you know, I want to see, uh, I want to see the size, and I want to see the concentration. And if they can't provide that to you, that's that's a red flag. So that means that they, they can't even provide, you know, a document to, to show you what they're what they're selling. You. Uh, again, competitors one and two, the graphs were okay, so you can kind of see that the graphs were okay. But the problem was the concentration in both of those uh, competitors' vials was very very low, the one fifteenth of what they were advertising. So okay, they had a, a reasonable uh, exosome. Um, we'll say just you know the size was reasonable. We didn't even get into the cargo. You know what's inside the exosome that actually matters, and what's on the outside of the exosome matters too. We'll go into we'll go that a little bit um, later, or we can have another uh, presentation. I can get in very very detail on what's actually inside these exosomes. So again, just, this is just the basics of what you guys need to know. Um, you want to talk about size and concentration, and this is, these are the, the, uh, the very simple data points that you can look at. So again, all three have bad graphs, the competitor three, five, and four. Um, again, they don't look anything like uh, what they're supposed to, and they have enormous sized particles. Um, and just to give you an idea, um, the, the larger the particle is, uh, the more space it takes up in the vial. So you can think of it like maybe they have um, you know, 500,000 particles of um, 500 nanometers. And what you really want is 15 billion particles at 130 nanometers, not 500,000, because they're not going to give you the clinical uh, outcomes that you're looking for with the patients. So again, this is just a little uh, more close-up. Um, again, you have you see the small particles on the left. So this is a, a, a quick analysis. There's 150 nanometer dot on the top of the blue, and a 500 nanometer uh, size particle on the bottom. So it takes up, that one 500 nanometer particle takes up 296 times more volume. Basically, what you're buying is a, is a very few large particles. And that's never going to give you the clinical outcomes that you want. Patients aren't going to come back to these treatments because they're not going to get the types of uh, results that we're seeing with ours. And I'll, do, I'll give you a quick summary on our clinical uh, applications. So this is a fibroblast wound healing assay. Again, this is the gold standard. Uh, we use this with all, all of our products, our stem cells, our, our uh, placenta extracts. And what we do is we grow fiber, fibroblasts in the Petri dish. We make a, a, a roadway or a scratch, they call it, in the middle of the Petri dish. We put the substance, in this case it would be the, the revived exosome product. We drop, right, put the drop straight in the middle of it. And then we wait for 48 hours and we see if the fibroblast flows up that wound. And, and as you see, the center one is our XO25, and the fibroblasts have completely gone and closed up the wound. And that is exactly what we're going to see. This proves to the physicians that when you inject this, you're going to get fibroblast migration, which will which will produce elastin and collagen and bring down the uh, inflammatory response. The competitor on the right, you can see, had very, very minimal migration um, into the wound. And also you can see, I don't know if you can see this, but um, there's a, a huge difference between the morphology of the cells. So the fibroblasts on our, um, uh, our test um, look exactly like the fibroblasts from, from zero hour. And on the right, you can see these, these fibroblasts, they look more like, uh, like tadpoles. They don't look like uh, fibroblasts. So the morphology has changed, which is you know, not, not very, you don't want to see that. So again, this is some of the um, the number of infiltrating cells. You can see XO25 uh, in, in the blue, competitor one, two, and then a positive control uh, is on the right. Is, is that a scratch so test? Is, uh, is that a scratch mm -hmm. test? Is there a scratch test? Uh, yes, correct. Yes. How did you make the scratch equal in, in, in all of these? How, how, how did you make the scratch diameter equal in, in all the samples? Uh, just a, a, we followed a, a, a fibroblast wound healing assay, which is a, a, a scientifically um, 
uh, certified assay in our lab. So we grow stem cells for us to grow fibroblasts. It's very, very easy. And then there's a, basically you just pick the, whatever size of the petri bit is, then there's a, a standard uh, equation that you use to make the diameter um, for the, the little the scratch that goes into the, into the petri dish. So if you use a smaller petri dish, it's a smaller scratch, and you use a larger petri dish, so it's a wider um, scratch. Okay. Great, thank you. So this is, okay, thanks for the question. Um, so this is some case reviews. And you guys are you know, uh, doctors and you want uh, patients to, uh, to have good outcomes. So we have a protocol, so we use uh, one bottle for the entire face, intradermal, subcutaneous, needle. Uh, what's unique about our product um, is you can use a very, very small gauge needle, 34 gauge needle, um, to do these injections. So uh, put a little bit of a numbing cream on the face, um, and you can use uh, just a, a cold ice pack, and you can do uh, all of the injections uh, very quickly. And what the doctors like that have used our products and other products is that they can use a 34 gauge needle. The other, as you can see, the other products had massive particle sizes. So they were forced to use 30 gauge needles, and that means that you know obviously a bigger, a bigger uh, rip in the skin basically because a, a needle is actually ripping the skin, um, and and it doesn't close up as fast. So and there's, you know, there's a bigger wound, so you're going to have you know red marks and things like that. So again, that's another benefit of this product is that it's such the particles are so small, doctors can use 34 gauge needles routinely to do the uh, injections of the face. So we do one bottle every uh, two to four weeks, over six times, and then we maintain about every three to six months the patient will come back in. And then, you know, these, these protocols can vary, but this is what the doctors here in Thailand um, and you know, in Southeast Asia are doing primarily. So this is a, a patient that was treated. Uh, again, you can see, was, we we're talking about the pigmentation. Um, within a week, you could see, you know, with, with the naked eye, uh, we also have scans where we, we used uh, lasers to scan look deep under the tissue. Uh, but you know, you guys may not have that in your in your clinic, so we wanted to have some cases that um, you know it was very obvious that there was improvement uh, after one week. Um, and then of course, you know, once the patients see the improvement, um, they're going to come back and do more treatments. So um, you know, this is a you know, real easy way to prove uh, that this uh, exosome product will do what we say it will do. So this is the other side of the, of the woman's face. Again, she's quite happy with the you know, lightening of the skin, um, smooth, and you know, pigmentation reduction was, was very, very obvious. Uh, again, here, here she is um, before and after. And then this is another um, another case. We have, hold on a second, I'm gonna lose my battery. Mm -hmm. Really amazing. Historically speaking, I didn't expect it within this connection. Bravo. Congratulations. This is a real story. Okay, sorry about that. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, was there a question? No, no, no. I got one. Go ahead. I have one. What culture medium do you use to expand your cell line? The medium. Uh, we don't use any animal derived products for our culture medium. If that's the question that you're asking. That, yeah, that's the big question because my understanding is yeah, most people who expand uh, that their, their cell life use fetal bovine serum. That's correct. So we do not use that. So we don't use the highest grade culture medium. It's very, very expensive. Um, we've tried, as you can imagine, over 15 years, we've had um, you know, scientists looking at different types of media. And one thing that we you know we adhere to is that you, you just can't grow those stem cells on a bad on a bad field, so to speak. I mean, if you don't use the right fertilizer, you don't use the right products. Uh, these cells aren't going to aren't going to grow and give you the clinical um, you know benefit that you're looking for. So we are, we're experts at growing cells, and um, so that's why when the exosome field started opening up, uh, you know, we wanted to get, get into the field and, and and you know see what we could do. And we're very very happy. Yeah, so is your culture media a closely guarded secret? Oh, yes. Of course it is. <laughs> That's, uh, it, we can't patent it because it's basically a recipe. Um, and you know, it's utilizing um, you know, different types of uh, you know, different, I'll tell you, to be very honest, um, a lot of it has to do with trial and error in the beginning, um, finding the right supplier. We also um, do QAQC on our, uh, on our culture media that, you know, that we bring in. 
all of the different kind of ingredients, if you want to, if you want to put it that way, um, to make sure that the vendors, um, you know, over COVID, there were some issues with supply chain, and we have to look at, you know, very closely to make sure that the uh, culture media that we're using for producing our little cord passive one stem cells, um, you know, was, was adequate. And, and, and it is, um, it's, not, it's not rocket science, but you know, you, you, need, you need good people. You know, one of our scientists, um, uh, his name is Dr. Nick Boyd Gibbons, um, he worked with uh, Shinya Yamanaka, who won the Nobel Prize in 2012 for induced pluripotent stem cells. So he actually was in the lab underneath um, uh, Dr. Yamanaka, um, and that's where he got a lot of his experience with, you know, understanding how to, how to uh, work with these cell lines. Um, so he's got, you know, he's one of the top guys in the world. Um, I don't know if you guys know, Chin and Yamanaka just um, signed a deal um, with a company called uh, Altos uh, Labs in, in California. And he's uh, their scientific uh, director. And Jeff Ethos um, and his friends put $3 billion um, into, into that particular company because they found that they can, uh, using some of these Yamanaka factors, they can. Uh, reverse uh, aging of mice, um, particularly kidneys and skin. Um, so we have, you know, that's, you know, that, that guy is getting three billion, we have his underlings, so to speak, in our lab. So, you know, we have, it's about the people. Um, the people that, that do this, they have to be passionate about it, they have to have experience, they have to, you know, understand. Um, you know, you can't cut corners with this, you know, and, and it, because the, the doctors won't, won't get the clinical benefit um, with their patients. and. You know, that's going to hurt, you know, that's going to hurt everybody's um, reputation. So, yes, this is a, a younger patient. Um, just, to follow that question. Question. just to follow that question, just to follow that question, to to lose this. Uh, do you disclosure the, the source of the umbilical cord or, and the Brian, uh, I mean, the Brian, uh, no, uh, no Brian uh, uh, thing there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. So we have a, uh, uh, that's a good question. So we use a local cord stem cells um, uh, from donors that are under 30 years of age. And we, we um, look at both the, the husband and the wife. Uh, we check all the medical history. We go through, um, we do all of the testing. We pay for all the testing for the, for the donors that supply the local cords. We also, um, so we do you know, pre-delivery pre testing. And then once the cord has uh, been uh, delivered, um, we'll analyze the cord upon receiving it in the lab. We, have, we follow both the EU and the US uh, FDA guidelines on um, uh, human tissue and culture products. So we do all of the, we, have, we actually have to follow both both uh, continents. Um, uh, we go to you know, treat patients from all over the world. Uh, we have to follow both continents um, guidelines for you know, looking for infectious diseases and viruses in the tissue sample. And then we process uh, our umbilical cords in a different way than other other uh, companies do. There's there's basically two ways of doing it. One way you can just put put the cord in a blender and add chemicals, and then you can centrifuge out the stem cells. The other way is called micro dissection, where you take the umbilical cord and cut it up into tiny little squares, and then you put those squares on a plate upside down, and the stem cell very gently migrates out off of the tissue into the growth medium, mm. and then you pull away the the, uh, the tissue, and then you have a petri dish full of stem cells that the colonies grow, and then from that set, from from that uh, petri dish, you'll have good, bad, and excellent colonies. And what we do is we remove um, the good and the bad, and we only select the excellent colonies, what they call the golden cells. A gentleman by the name of Dr. Neil Warden um, in Panama kind of owned this term, um, but it's a process of natural selection. We go through every single uh, cord, and we, we only select the very, very best uh, cells. So again, that's more expensive. The other way is a lot cheaper. You can get more cells. You can grow more cells that way. But clinically, they won't be as good. Yeah, I understand that down in Panama, for gold cells, uh, he would categorize some patients that responded better. So it was response-based to determine what the gold cells were. How, how do you identify them? Uh, yeah, we do. We do uh, a very similar. So the, the lab is uh, right, literally next to the clinic. So when the when you know over the years, um, uh, the, the scientists and the doctors are talk very closely with each other. Um, we we also do what's called conditioning, or some people call it priming, 
of the cells. So if a patient had a stroke and they came to see us, we would um, take the cells out of the cryopreservation and then we would um, prime the cells with some peptides and maybe some RNA for uh, normal regeneration. So that the stem cells have an idea of what they're gonna do uh, in the body. If we have a patient that had a knee, uh, you know, uh, osteoarthritis, uh, we would prime those cells with um, peptides for bone regeneration, uh, cartilage, um, ligament, so that the stem cells, you know, epigenetically are already kind of being told, you're going to fix the knee, and then when we inject them into the knee, they're going to, they go and then they quickly start uh, communicating with the local cells, and then they start releasing exosomes, primarily, um, and then those exosomes trigger the, the, the resident stem cells to generate and, and make new tissue in that, in that injured area. Yeah, I think that's great. Uh, so if, when, you, when you're trying to get, collect the stem cells, I assume, do you put an attractant in the media to, to get those stem cells, which I would presume crawl out of the little micro, mi micro uh, pieces of tissue onto the culture plate? Do you put an attract, some yes. people attract the, the stem cells yeah. to crawl out? Yeah, please. That, that is, um, you know, a pr proprietary solution that's been developed to kind of get the cells to, to migrate out of the tissue onto the culture media. And then, of course, you change culture media based on what you want to do. We want to culture them or expand them. Then we, we use a different culture media. And then, again, at the end, when we want to direct them or, or condition them, for instance, we want them to make all kinds of exosomes for skin regeneration, which is what this presentation is all about. We have to use a different culture media to get the sex cells to release uh, exosomes that have cargo specifically related to regenerating uh, skin or activating fibroblasts and downregulating immune cells. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, Dr. Lambert asked one question. I'm not sure that you addressed it, and that is uh, prions. Is there a way to screen for prions? Uh, sure. Um, the, my, my understanding, I'm not an expert on this, um, but my understanding is that, um, that they will develop uh, in very late passage uh, stem cell cultures um, that, uh, that are, we'll say, I mean, I've seen like passage 19. I, I, have, a, you know, I have some research documents where um, the stem cells are, are have been grown so so much that they start to disintegrate. They actually um, basically start coming apart. They eject things. We didn't get into the apoptotic bodies, um, which are associated with exosomes, but that would be how they would come about. Would be the, the as the cell is dying, um, it's it's packaging up some proteins, um, and this is where uh, misfolded proteins they might get packaged up in these apoptotic bodies at cell death. So. For us, we never culture that late, so we're never we're not really concerned with that. But certainly, that is you know it's been identified in the literature at passage 19. There's um, there's cytoplasmic ejection is what they call it, where the cell just starts ejecting its cytoplasm. How how many passes do you do? Uh, for our clinical grade stem cells, we just do passage one. So if we're going to provide stem cell for a patient, either intravenous or a dermal injection or intraarticular injection or a muscle injection, that will only be passage one. And then as we, when we culture cells for exosome production, if the, if the cells are in a really, really excellent condition, we can go to passage two. Very, very rarely will we ever go to passage three. But, but I, you know, I, I want to you know, say that we, you know, we can, if we have a fantastic source of cells, and they're just extraordinary, and they just keep secreting exosomes at, at a very high level and great rate, um, then we will go that far. But generally speaking, it's only passing one and passes two for our exosome product. Uh, you guys are top notch. Yeah, yeah. Uh, bravo. Right. You should, you should yeah, continue. I love this stuff. It's great. You guys have that finish a great uh, time of being doctors. Fantastic. So I'll I'll just finish up with a couple of a couple more slides on the um, on the, the clinical um, results that we're seeing. Again, here's the close up. Uh, again, the uh, pigmentation uh, is very clear. I mean, there's been at least a 50% reduction in pigmentation. We we have some scans um, 
we use um, uh, some equipment that has laser tagging, we can make maps on the face, things like that. I, I didn't want to put that in, I just want to make it easy uh, for you guys to see this stuff. Again, here's another one. Well, this, again, these are just one week after because a lot of the positions that we're working with, um, you know, that was kind of their big concern. They weren't seeing a lot of results with the green products and the lengthwise products. So for them, you know, we, we had to kind of you know, show them quickly, look, our, our product will show you results in a week. And then, then you know, they trust us and they'll start using it um, more, more long term. You know, three, at least three treatments, I think, is, is the minimum for most, for most uh, patients for this type of uh, skin regeneration. Um, this is another another patient again. Just one week after, you can see the skin's a lot smoother. The pigmentation's gone down. Um, there's been, there, there's clearly some acne scars that have, that have you know kind of resolved themselves. Um, so again, these are just one week one week after um, we did the presentations. So for like for the doctors, you know what what do they care about? Um, less pain. You know again, I told you you can use a 34 gauge needle. Um, you know, it's very, very easy to, to do these types of uh, injections. Um, you, it absorbs very, very quickly. You use a very small amount. Um, so you may have a little tiny bump and then and it goes away. It'll be time before the patient leaves the office, most of the cases that uh, the, the product has been absorbed. And there's no remnants for edema. I've seen doctors uh, that actually treated themselves with um, some of the products that you guys are familiar with. And they, you know, they were red for a whole week. I mean, you just can't have that kind of product. That, that means there's something wrong with it. So again, in conclusion, um, you know, our exosome product uh, can help with aging skin in the face. High quality exosomes, um, you know, we tested this extensively. I've got a hundred slides I could go through with you guys and go into the cargo and, and, um, and RNA, you know, we, we use our sequencing equipment. Um, so I can really go into that in more detail. We can do another, another presentation on the time. Um, so essentially less pain and downtime. So basically that's what that's what the physicians are looking for. You know, a good quality product, um, the patients get results and they tell friends and family and keeps your keeps your practice busy. That's what we're looking for. Uh, so that ends the uh, the presentation. I'm open to any any Q and A that you guys have. What what depth do you inject <laughs> Uh it's just intradermal or as far as it depends on where you're doing it on the face. Uh, the, the doctors that I work with say uh, very similar to um, Botox. They're, they follow that guideline um, or any other uh, uh, intradermal uh, uh, treatment. Yeah, so it depends on where you are on the on the face. Yeah, don't, don't use the Botox uh, because that, that's injected at different levels of where you're on the face, but probably just some subepidermal is probably what they're doing. Probably just uh, mm -hmm. um, this, yeah, Ryan Walter. Okay, thank you. Thank you. The, what's that? Sorry. I, I try not to get uh, too into that because I think you know, the, the physicians have their own kind of ways of doing things and you know, depending on how they classify the product. And you know, what we do is we, we just get product in their hands and they just start working with it and they'll, they'll come up with their own guidelines based on the patients. Um, we're, not, we're not experts at, at that. That's what we, we look for the doctors to do that. So I just had one quick question. So currently U.S. guidelines, uh, topical applications only, right? Yeah, there's been some there were some changes. That, um, again, I focus on Asia, um, some some in Europe. Obviously, um, I've done some work in South America. I've been I worked in 57 different countries. Um, so the you know the, the guidelines uh, in the U.S. I, I, my understanding is they just changed um, some of the the production requirements, and there I think there were three new class three new requirements that they put in place for manufacturers. Uh, it took a lot of the uh, took a lot of the competitors I guess out of the market, uh, at least in the U.S. Uh, I'm not clear on what, what their current guidelines is. I mean, you know, there, I know there's production being done in Florida, for instance. Uh, that's one of the products that we, we looked at, Chimera. Uh, they have a pretty good a pretty good product. It's frozen like ours. Um, the price is again, it's about four to five times uh, what what we typically see um, you know, when we sell our product through uh, through our distributors around the world. Um, yeah, but, but, the product, um, but you you are giving this in Venus in the states or any other mechanism except for topically. Uh, right. So our our first launch is going to be the, the revived EXO fifteen and twenty five, which is for primarily aesthetic applications, and then we already have um, four candidates um, that we 
like I told you, we, we can kind of direct the stem cells to produce exosomes based on what we want them to repair in the body. Mm -hmm. And we have, um, we're going to have a, a, a neurological uh, repair exosome, if you want to call it that, that we can do intravenous applications that will probably be about 10 times um, the amount. So um, you have 6 trillion exosomes in the periphery of your body. So you need a pretty so, good dose. So our minimum uh, IV, you want to call that, IV will be 150 billion exosomes, and then the, the kind of the higher grade will be 250 billion exosomes. And you're probably going to need to do a couple vials uh, to get some kind of clinical outcome. So what, what is so the, what is the, we the have, uh, what's the current cost of the, of the of the facial ones in the US here, the ones that you have? Uh, it, uh, in the U.S., uh, so I'm in Bangkok, Thailand, so that my company's uh, out of Thailand. Um, I, I know that some of the pricing in the states is about a thousand U.S. dollars for their small um, ID um, and four thousand dollars for their large ID uh, exosome product. So I work with a doctor that treats a lot of patients in the Dominican Republic, uh, particularly autism, and he worked uh, primarily with stem cells. Um, and uh, for, for these types of patients uh, to try to get you know, the anti-inflammatory effects in the brain and neurological regeneration. And he switched over uh, to, to exosomes and he was seeing some really, really good outcomes. And you know, he's messaging me like, oh man, we just use exosomes. And at about six months later, he messaged me back that he, that he switched back to, to stem cells um, because he wasn't seeing the clinical outcome. And what, what we believe was that the, um, when, when, as the company became more successful and started producing more product, the, the lab um, technicians and scientists were under a lot of pressure to increase the, the amount of exosomes, putting pressure on the, the source material of the stem cell, you know, that umbilical cord tissue that they were using, and the quality of the, of the EVs or the exosomes um, suffered as a result of trying to do mass production. So you know, we, we were very cognizant of that. You know, so we, we've seen it happen. You know, we, we've had doctors come back and tell us. So what? But not the same as what. I, but the uh, the ones that are topical, the the uh, the ones that you showed here, the XO fifteen and twenty five. What what would those retail for approximately? Is that that? Right. No, no. I think Basically, that's the uh, oh, there it is. Yeah. yeah. I think uh, the the retail for uh, for, it depends on where it's where you are in the world, and the the big issue is everything's frozen. It has to be uh, transported on dry ice. Um, so uh, it depends on where you are in the world as far as the, uh, the the transport costs are a big a big uh, chunk of that. So I'm not sure what where where where, where would you want to be buying them? The U.S. Right? In the U.S. Yeah. Okay. Well, okay. So uh, that we haven't um, uh, kind of entered that market yet. Um, we have so many customers around the world that aren't in the U.S. Let's say um, Europe, Spain. Yeah. How, how about Albania? That is where Albania is. He's our expert on, on moving this stuff around, um, so he's going to be our partner to uh, to help us uh, get this to to positions and get some pricing in place. Um, obviously, as we get more and more volume, you know, the pricing will come down. Um, the first. You know the first lots. Um, you know, is, you know, so as we can help support you with uh, with orders and you know, getting this in your hands. And I, you know, I recommend that you can try to get some and, and, and use it and, and use it against the you know better products and see the differences. Um, you know, we've been very successful with some of the products that we've launched um, because the, you know the physicians um, you know are very happy with the patients coming back over and over and over and telling friends and family. You don't have to spend money on marketing. You don't have to spend a lot of time on you know, money. You know, trying to educate you know the customer they just come in they want that product because you know, it works. So that's, again, that's kind of our part. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. Okay. 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 We'll, we'll see what he says. What did you say? Do you know? Uh, do you know the Elevate liposomal exosome product that Dr. Plews T L E W S made that's stored at room temperature? Uh, no, alpha what? Alpha base? It's a, uh, his name is Plews, P-L-E-W-S. Uh, he's out of Stanford. And uh, he made a liposomal delivery system with 
uh, umbilical cord, Wharton's jelly, derived exosomes, T0 exosomes. And I'd be curious if you look at that product. I don't mean that for sure. I have, I, we have to look at that. Yeah, here, it's, but I'd love to take a look at it. It's called Elevate. E L E B A I. Okay. E L E B A I. And what do they advertise as far as the number of exosomes and the price? Uh, the price is good. You know, it's mainly for the post op, but it's like $150 for the post op. Okay. And around. And that's, I think that's what I sell it for. So and I, it's not frozen. Yeah. No, it's not frozen. It's, it's not another that doesn't look like you. Oh, but it's lyophilized. Is it powder? It's a cream. It's, it's a cream, yes. It, actually, it's not a cream. It's a, it's a, it's it's a syrup. It's like it's a, a, like an oil. A syrup. Yeah, but it's a topical. This one, it's mesotherapic. Yeah, yeah. This can be injected with more. Well, I mean, it's a cool product. He's got great product. Well, I'm just okay. curious about this. Uh, it's, it's time now to really summarize. Uh, thank you very much. It was really historical. Thank you for the guy who did this yeah. possible. A big applause for you. Yeah. One, one question for fixing once forever or for two years since now in the future. Do you think that we have a minimal chance one day to produce from fat our own exosome-like particles to be much closer to our patient without waiting frozen product from Antarctica or from Bangkok. So, so many is already doing. Yeah. Right. What do you think? So to my case, yes. yeah. Okay. Do you yeah. think that based yeah. on yeah. your knowledge and your studies, we are able using the fat to produce from SDF some particles like exosome lights? Uh, I mean, you, you could use uh, your own, but the exosomes are, they're, um, you, you kind of want to, want to be in, in control of the, of the source cells. So one day old cells are going to be better than, yeah. you know, 40 year old cells. Um, you know, they're just, that's just, you know, the, the fact that we genetically, so when you know them, yeah. um, but I this is for everything available. You know, yeah. Yes, right. Right. T T zero. T zero. T zero. Yes, yeah, the moment when we are starting. Yes. Thank you very, very much. Sure. Uh, stay in touch.